right, so this is the last part of 4.1. Yay. Inference for sampling and samples, and then surveys, what can go wrong? Um, so definition here you might want to write down on inference. Basically, the process of drawing conclusions about a population on the basis of sample data is called inference because we infer information about the population from what we know about the sample. So even though it's just the sample, we can still make an inference about the population based on the sample data. All right, so an example here. Um, suppose that 70% of the students in a large university attended all their classes last week. Okay, so 70% went to all their classes. Imagine taking a simple random sample of 100 students on the campus and recording the proportion of students in the sample who went to class every week. Would the sample proportion be exactly 0.7? What do you guys think? No. Okay? Even though this is the answer, this is the exact answer, right? If you just do a sample or whatever, you're not going to get exactly 0.7. Um, would the sample proportion be close to it? That depends on what we mean by close. So the following graph shows the results of taking 500 simple random samples, 500 of them. Each have a size of 100 people, and they recorded the proportion of students who attended all their classes in each sample. So what do we see? We're going to get a graph that looks like this. We did a dot plot. Um, the graph should always be centered up around the true value. All right? So the true answer is that 70% went to all their classes. So that should be the middle. Um, all the sample proportions fall between 0.55 and 0.85. So we shouldn't be surprised if the difference between the sample proportion and the population proportion is as large as 15%. All right. Notice the graph has a very distinctive bell shape. What, what are we going to end up getting, you guys? Anybody know what this is from chapter 2? The bell curve, which is what kind of distribution? normal distribution, okay? So the more and more samples you take, the more and more normally distributed it should look, right? And it should always center around the true proportion, but you won't always get exactly that, right? Some of your samples are going to be off from the true proportion. Um, so one point worth making now, which we'll talk about later in the book, is larger random samples give better information about the population than smaller samples, right? So if we only did five of those random samples, we wouldn't really be able to tell a lot. But if we increase even more, we're going to get an even more bell-shaped curve, okay? So obviously, the more simple random samples you do, the better statistics you're going to have. question. Probably more of them would be my guess, but we'll learn the exact numbers you're supposed to do in the week of chapter. Oh, one more thing, you guys. There is called a margin of error, and you should write that down. So margin of error is like how much you're off by. Like this one's off by 15%. And we're going to learn what's acceptable and what's not acceptable margin of error later in the book. But that's just some terminology you want to talk about. So if the true value is 0.7, it's okay in this problem to be off by 15% when you have a sample. Okay? All right. So what can go wrong? Um, sampling is often done using a list of individuals in the population. Such lists are seldom accurate or complete, and this result is called under coverage. So you want to write down that definition. Undercoverage occurs when some members of the population cannot be chosen in the sample. So let's say I wanted to find out if people in the United States want to increase funding for Medicare. Okay. And let's say the way that I was surveying it was I was going to call all the landlines and ask all the landline people if they want to increase funding for Medicare. What's wrong with my survey? Yeah. Exactly. So do you any, like, I don't have a landline, okay? 
So people who are older typically want to increase funding for Medicare than people who are younger. So if we're calling only landlines, we're going to get an overestimate because that's probably older people most likely. And so under coverage means you're leaving people out because you're not even calling people who only have cell phones. Okay? Um, so we've got another example, a uh, survey of households. For example, uh, we would miss homeless people or prison inmates and students in dorms. All right? And we've got the landline one, same thing, you're going to miss people. Okay? So one of the most serious sources of bias um, in a sample survey is non-response. Non-response. And I'd write down this definition. So non-response occurs when an individual chosen for the sample can't be contacted or refuses to participate. So under coverage is when you're just leaving people out, like you're not even giving them the option, right? Non-response is when they're refusing to participate or you can't contact them. You call them like five times and they don't answer their phone. So non-response can occur only after a sample has been selected. This is important, you guys, to be able to tell the difference because people confuse non-response and voluntary response sample. All right? So the difference is, and you want, probably should make note in your notes, that in voluntary response sample, people have already chosen to participate. So we're not talking about like who did, who didn't. In the voluntary response, you're like, yep, I want to be a part of that survey. So everybody already said they're doing it, okay? Whereas this is afterwards, they were picked. These people were picked, but then they were like, no, I'm not going to answer the phone. Or I'm just going to refuse to participate, okay? So they are different. All right. Um, other problems occur when people give inaccurate answers. So they might lie about their age, their income, or their drug use. Uh, they may misremember how many hours they spent on the internet last week, or they might make up an answer to a question that they don't understand. So, yep, gender, race, ethnicity, age, behavior of the interviewer is another one. So sometimes the interviewer might ask it more, I don't know, in a demeaning way, so that might affect their response. Um, so a systematic pattern of inaccurate answers in a survey leads to response bias. So write that one down, response bias. For me, the most one that like comes to mind is like people aren't going to talk about, I don't know, their drug use. That seems like an obvious one that people wouldn't want to respond to. So response bias, they're lying. So they are answering, they're just answering incorrectly. All right, so the wording of the question, and I would write that down, wording of the question can also influence the response. So, for example, how do Americans feel about illegal immigrants? So, the way they ask it, should illegal immigrants be prosecuted and deported for being in the U.S. illegally, or shouldn't they? Ask this question in an opinion poll. 59% favored deportation, but when the very same sample was asked whether illegal Im immigrants who have worked in the United States for two years should be given a chance to keep their jobs and eventually apply for legal status, 62% said they should. So different questions give different impressions and attitudes toward illegal immigrants. How you phrase it definitely makes a difference. All right. Another one that was interesting, the order of the questions mattered. I like this example. So uh, I would write down order of questions. Okay, is another one. So ask a sample of college students these two questions. One, how happy are you with your life in general? And the second question, how many dates did you have last month? So there's no association between these, but when they switched the order and they first said, how many dates did you have last month, and then how happy you are, people responded worse to the happiness question after thinking about how many dates they had last week or month. That's funny. So anyways, um, I guess that the order matters. <laughs> all right. So let's write down really quick, you guys, all the different biases, just kind of a list of things so you guys have um, – a list. Uh, what kind of sampling did we learn was like bad sampling? What were the two things we did first? Okay, we had voluntary response sample. Okay, and what was the other one? Convenience. Okay, we had convenience sampling. 
And then today we added under coverage. where uh, we just miss people, and response bias, where people lie about stuff, and uh, the wording of the question, contributes bias, and we also have non-response, where people are picked for the survey and then choose to not respond. And then the last one we just did was order of questions. And see if we can tell what the difference is. Uh, each of the following is a possible source of bias in a sample survey. Name the type of bias that could result. Um, the sample is chosen at random from a telephone directory. Which type of bias is that? Someone decides. You guys think they're using a telephone directory? Which one of those? Harley, what's your guess? We think non-response because people just won't like answer. Tyler, what do you think? You think that? <laughs> what about? Uh, yeah, what do you think? It is actually under coverage because we're leaving people out of the telephone directory, those people who are like homeless, don't have a telephone, um, so it's under coverage. Okay, some people cannot be contacted in five calls. We're calling them and we're calling them and we're calling them. So Taylor, what do you think this one is? This one is non-response, okay? So they're actually definitely choosing not to answer their phone, all right? Interviewers choose people walking by on the sidewalk in an interview. Donovan, what do you think? Doesn't sound like he's using sampling, but what kind of bias is it? This is another example of under coverage. Okay. Some people are not out walking on the street. Who's not out walking on the street? <laughs> Perfect. And <laughs> people in jail, maybe. People without legs, all right? That's the thought. I'm pretty sure they could be, like, in a wheelchair down the street. All right. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. A survey paid for um, by makers of disposable diapers found that 84% of the sample opposed banning disposable diapers. Here's the actual question. It is estimated that disposable diapers account for less than 2% of the trash in today's landfills. In contrast, beverage containers, third-class mail, and yard waste are estimated to account for about 21% of the trash in landfills. Given this, in your opinion, would it be fair to ban disposable diapers? So explain how the wording of the question could result in bias. Um, yeah, what do you think, Maddie? Definitely, right? It's already telling you wh what's worse, and so therefore, oh, it doesn't seem that bad. So we've got bias by the wording of the question. Um, so it's probably an overestimate based on that. Yeah. They, if they phrase it differently, it would definitely influence what I would think, right? Yeah. So it's just wording of the question is all you have to say, though, you know? Yeah. I mean, you have to explain. I would explain whether it's an overestimate or underestimate kind of a thing based on what they did. Okay? 